So one of the things that's, I think, most important about your growth as a proof writer and a proof discoverer as a mathematician um, is just the practice of, first of all, knowing, and then second of all, applying the definitions of things. Uh, so to me, looking at this proof through my expert blind spot, because I've been thinking about this kind of mathematics for a decade and a half, um, looking at this problem, I kind of see it as well as just a straightforward application of the definition of supremum. Um, but what does that look like is what we're going to focus on for the next few minutes here. Um, so when we first talked about this on Monday, uh, we talked about the definition of m being the supremum of e, and we talked a little bit about why in this problem we know that that supremum exists and is a real number. Why was that again? Completeness axiom, because E is non-empty and because it's bounded from above, the completeness axiom for the real numbers says that the supremum of E exists and is a real number. Um, and then furthermore, the definition of supremum is, has these two pieces. Um, the first part of being a supremum is that uh, the number M has to be an upper bound for the set E, right? So for all elements of the set E, that element has to be less than or equal to M. So that's the first thing, is that M has to be an upper bound. And the second part is that any other upper bound that we could try to make for the set E would have to be greater than or equal to M. Right? So M is the least possible upper bound. Um, here's a purported proof. How do we feel about that proof, or what questions? Allie? Which of these four steps um, does anyone want to either hear more about or are not comfortable with or would like to propose an alternative for? Maybe, let me ask this, what do you think is the weakest step out of the four in this argument? From step two to step three, what is the justification? If we know that there exists an x in E which is greater than the supremum of F, then how do we know that there exists an x in F that's greater than the supremum of F? I didn't write it on the board, but I think you said it. Uh, because E is a subset of F. Yeah. Every x is also Right, so what's happening there is just taking this part of the argument and changing it to that. Right? Because E is a subset of F, every element of E uh, must also be an element of F, just by definition of subset. So that's what links those two steps together. The why in step two, if we assume, by way of contradiction, that supreme of E is greater than supreme of F, I'm going to put by way of contradiction, I'm going to abbreviate it up here. Um, if we make that assumption, how does that guarantee for us that there exists an X, I'm sorry, that there exists an X in E, which is greater than the supreme of F? Okay. Or at least an upper bound. Right, an upper bound, exactly. So if, if it were not the case that x were greater than the supreme, that there existed an x in E which is greater than the supremum of f, if not, then the supremum of f would be an upper bound, would be an upper bound for E, right? And if the supremum of f is an upper bound for E, what do we know about the relationship between the supremum of f and the supremum of E? What does supremum mean again? Supremum of E is the least upper bound. And so if supremum of F were an upper bound for E, then the supremum of E would have to be less than or equal to it, right? Because it's the least upper bound. So that's the justification that we can put in here for step two, right? That if the supremum of E is greater than the supremum of F, then there must be an element of E which is greater than the supremum of F. Because if there weren't, the supremum of F would be an upper bound for the set E. And if the supremum of F, if this number here, if this number were actually an upper bound for the set E, then the least upper bound for the set E would have to be less than or equal to that number. So this is why we know that there must be an element of E that's greater than the supremum of F. If, by way of contradiction, supremum of E is greater than the supremum of F. So uh, the question is, does step three still follow now that we've written all of the stuff over here about step two? So yeah, all the stuff that I wrote over here was a justification for why step two was true, but it's a justification by way of contradiction. So if step two were not the case, then we would end up with the supremum of E being less than or equal to the supremum of F, but we have assumed, by way of contradiction, that that's not the case. Okay. 
So in a way, it almost makes me wonder whether there is a direct proof of this statement using this logic that's written over here on the right. Okay. If the supremum of E is less than or equal to the supremum of F, then maybe we can make an argument about supremum of F being an upper bound for E um, in that case, because it's greater than or equal to the least upper bound for E. So there may be a way that is suggested by the writing over here to do this directly instead of doing it by way of contradiction. Um, but otherwise, I think that the logic that's here in this contradiction proof is, is, pretty, um, uh, is pretty solid. Um, another purpose that I had in, in talking about this is that when I was thinking about this, the first thing that I did when thinking about a proof is I actually thought about trying to reframe the definition of supremum in a couple of different ways that can sort of help me in my mind to see what this step two is all about. So one of the ways of understanding what it means, for instance, uh, to be the least upper bound, um, so it, written in green up here, all upper bounds for E are greater than or equal to M. Um, another way of reframing that is to say that any number N which is less than M will not be an upper bound for E. That's another way of thinking about what the least upper bound is. If I try to nudge that upper bound any further to the left, it won't be an upper bound anymore. But then if that's the case, if n is not an upper bound for E, then that means that there must exist an element of the set which is greater than n. Right? So that's the same kind of logic that was ultimately used in this part of the contradiction proof that Matt outlined for us. Um, but when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about it from the point of view of let's, let's just rethink what the definition of supremum is and, and use that equivalent formulation. Um, but either way, it uh, should work just fine. 